Well, welcome again to the study on the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 20 of Revelation, and it is, I've entitled this study for chapter 20, God's Enemies Destroyed Forever. This is good news, let me tell you, <laughs> when all enemies and all people in the killing camp are gone forever and ever, and there's only righteousness that reigns. So I'm really excited about this study today, and I'm glad that you've joined us. So that those of you that have been able to join us by Zoom, we're happy you're here. And all of you that will be looking at this recording later on, thank you for taking the time to study this very important book in the New Testament, in the whole Bible, as a matter of fact. It sums it all together, doesn't it? So welcome back. And mm -hmm. Tim, could you just start us again with sure. a word of prayer? Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to have your word to be able to open and read and study and share and just discover your guidance, your blessings, and that we might know you and love you more fully and experience your plan for our lives. Thank you for blessing this time right now as we meet together in Jesus' holy name. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, again, welcome back to the book of Revelation, Revelation 20 today. And it's about that millennium. Everybody has all kinds of debates about what the millennium means. <laughs> and you can hear all kinds of theories. Mm -hmm. I guess we need to go to the Bible to find the answers, don't we? And find out what the Bible does, says and what the Bible symbols are and see what the symbols do represent in this chapter with this starts the last and the seventh section, which is the last section of the book of Revelation, Revelation 20, 21, and 22, which I call King Jesus Reigns, because it actually starts in this chapter. <laughs> the, the discussion about his reigning begins here. Not that his reign starts in this chapter, but it talks about the beginning of his reign here in this chapter. Um, and so this section is uh, very important because it kind of answers God's promise. Way back in Isaiah 42, God promised that he will bring justice to the nations. You know, in fact, it even harks back further than that. It goes way back to Genesis 3.15. Remember that first, that promise of the son? When Adam and Eve had sinned and God, Jesus, God is talking to the serpent, that old dragon, that serpent, that Satan in the garden. And he said, what do you say? Genesis 3, 15. I'm going to read it to you because I don't want to just misquote anything here. It's the most important promise in the Bible in some ways because it promised the son because here's Adam and Eve naked, exposed before God without any hope. And he says to the, to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all of the wild beasts. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Notice the place of Satan is under your feet. He's on the ground. Authority, anything under the feet is under the authority. We don't have to be under his authority. We can choose not to be. And God's authority is over all. So we're, and I will put enmity or hatred between you, talking to the serpent and the woman, and between your offspring, that singular, and hers. Your offspring and her offspring. It's interesting, they're talking about offspring, which means that that can be singular, but it can be your son or anything in that lineage versus this lineage. There's two lineages here, remember? There's a, those are the Satan's family. And Jesus even calls them your sons of the devil or sons of God. There's going to be two lineages here, but there's going to be everything that's in his offspring versus her offspring. He, singular, the offspring of the woman, will crush your head and you will strike his heel, which is the mortal wound. When you crush the head, yeah. it had a mortal wound. And when did that happen, by the way? When was the mortal wound struck to Satan? At the cross. 
at the cross. You're right. <laughs> we have talked about this before. But the final crushing that is forever destroyed doesn't happen until when? The coming. God makes it really clear that once more, he'll shake the earth. Once more. Not again and again and then coming again and then coming again and then coming again and coming again. Oh, no, no. He finished salvation. It was done, accomplished at the cross. Now he's coming once more. So we can be with him. But at that point, there's no more of anything of wickedness. It's destroyed and judged and judgment poured out. And that's what this chapter is all about. So remember, this is a fulfillment of what was promised there because the fulfillment of everything about crushing that head of the serpent mortally forever is promised in that promise of the son, Jesus Christ, the offspring of the woman. And we are his offspring. We are the offspring of that son. Talks about us in that those terms of the Bible, as you know. So. Satan is bound a thousand years. We're going to dive right into Revelation 20. Let's assign somebody here. Patty, Revelation 21 and 2. And then Lynn, if you can have your finger at Revelation 1, 17 and 18. Just flip you know, so a note right there. We're going to go there next. Okay. So let's read Revelation 20. An angel, and we're going to discuss it and break it down and talk about what these symbols mean. Remember, when we're in the book of Revelation, you can't make the symbol be the reality, otherwise, you miss the meaning. <laughs> it's like look analyzing the flag instead of saying what does the flag represent. Okay, so we're going to go through and discuss these things carefully this way. Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Okay. Who is the angel from heaven? Jesus. Yes, it's absolutely Jesus. He's the one that binds Satan, as we just talked about in that promise. So it's obviously him. Angel means messenger, as we know. We talked about that before. Coming down out of heaven, so it's clearly him, having the key to the abyss. What does a key represent in scripture? Do you have a key? What do you do with keys? You can open or lock and close out. You can keep things in, keep things out, open and, yes, open mm -hmm. and shut doors, and it's authority. It's interesting, this whole idea, this authority of the kingdom. In the city of Jerusalem was protected. Uh, there was an Old Testament story, and it's back in 2 Kings 18 and 19. And it was about King, um, the king of Assyria had come. And that's, of course, was Nineveh's, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, which was another place like Babylon, you know. <laughs> Nimrod had built both those areas back in Genesis 10. Wicked places after the flood were set up. The first places set up after the flood. And the city of Jerusalem was protected from this destruction from that king of Assyria, which is the capital of Nineveh. And basically he had said, I'm going to come and destroy your city. And he mocked the living God. And good king Hezekiah, he stood up and said, what are we going to do, God? <laughs> and there was an administrator, the son of the administrator of the palace of the king was godly. And basically, Isaiah uses that Old Testament story as a type of what we see in Revelation 20. It's very kind of interesting because actually what happened with Sennacherib, which was the name of the king of Assyria from Nineveh, he and his army were out there and they prayed to God. And guess what? They ended up killing themselves, except the king was still alive. And old Sennacherib goes back to Nineveh. And guess what happens to him? What happened to him, Tim? Do you remember the story? He was in his, the temple praying to his dead God. He was no God at all. And while in that temple, 
one of his, I think it was one of his own family, but anyway. Two of his sons. Two of his sons come in and strike him down dead with a sword right in his own temple. You see, because that kingdom and that palace and that city was protected because they believed in the one true and living God. And so Isaiah talks about that son of the administrator for the king of Jerusalem is given a king, a key, and God will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. <laughs> this was the house of David, by the way, that was there. And it's a foreshadowing in Isaiah 22 of Jesus Christ. There'll be a peg. He'll have the key that no one, he can, it'll be a secure peg on which you can be sure this will not change. And with that key, he will open the door that no one can shut and shut the door that no one can open. That's the key of David. We saw this already, of course, in the seventh church, the sixth church, the faithful church, the church of Philadelphia. We talked about the key of David, and that was way back then. But this is, again, that kind of thing. In Revelation 1, 17 and 18, it talks about Jesus having a key. We've already read this in Revelation 1, but just to review you, it's been a few weeks or months since we read it. So if you please read that for us, Lynn. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. So who holds the keys of death and Hades? Jesus, Jesus Christ himself. He holds that key. He determines what's the fate of them. Thank God we're going to see it right here in this chapter. It's interesting that that's alluded to right in the first chapter of Revelation in that beautiful, glorious picture of Jesus Christ. He says it right there. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that an assurance at the beginning of the book that he's in charge of it? You think what's craziness going on in the world right now? Terrible things are happening right now, as we know. But Jesus holds the key. What is death? Death is death. What is Hades? The grave. Death can be spiritual death. It can be just dying. But it doesn't mean you're alive. You're dead. You can be alive but dead spiritually. That's right. There is a sense there. But Hades, Hades is the grave. That's a, that physical death. He holds the key to those. And what is this man, this mighty God we serve? What did he do? What did we see him, see him doing chapter, in verse two here? He sees that dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan. In other words, don't miss out who he's talking about. It tells you here, you can't miss the point. This is a very important point. And bound him for a thousand years. What does it mean? And we already discussed, when did that happen? When did the binding happen of Satan? At the, at the cross. At the cross, he says, now is the time for the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. What does a thousand mean? Does a thousand years mean a thousand years? Or are we making the symbol be the symbol if we say a thousand years equals a thousand years? It's the complete of the testing. It's the completeness of the testing. Because 10 is the number of the test and the, to the third power. For the righteous, a thousand would be what? You would have life at the end of the thousand years. There'd be fullness of decision. Remember, we talked about judgment cannot happen until, in fact, until there's a fullness of iniquity. God will not pour judgment on this earth until the cup of iniquity is Full. We talked about that already in a previous study, how that's crucial when we talked about the hour of trial. If you didn't hear that study, it's Revelation 17. We go in detail on the hour of trial. And there had to be a cup of iniquity full. And I explained it there, why that was from Old Testament places where God's judgment fell. But we see that the for the righteous in Revelation 14, when it says, 
um, no, excuse me, Revelation 7. In Revelation 6, we see the sixth seal and the wicked crying out, who can stand the hour of God's judgment is coming? Who can stand? We see the answer in Revelation 7. God is telling the four angels to not blow anywhere on the earth. They cannot blow until what? A, the seal of the living God is placed on the forehead of every single righteous person. They're sealed with the name of God, the very seal of God. That angel comes from the east and seals them from all the tribes of Israel. 12,000 from each tribe. You want to go review that lesson? It's Revelation 7. Go back and look at it. You look, understand a 12,000, the number of the kingdom. We got 12,000 there. They have passed the test from Genesis to Revelation. They are fully committed to God. They're in the complete harvest. God doesn't have a harvest sometime and another harvest, another harvest. No, he has one body, doesn't he? One body, one salvation in Jesus Christ. All Old Testament, New Testament come together into one family forever face to face with God. Oh, what a day that will be. But 12,000 from each of the tribes. But when it comes to the end of the test, what do we see happens? There's a, for the wicked, there's a fullness. They did not pass the test. We see it again and again. They refuse to repent. We see that in the six bowls of God's wrath, the seven bowls of God's wrath, the pouring out of the seven last mm -hmm. plagues. Mm -hmm. They refuse to repent. They refuse to repent. We see it some other places in Revelation too. They didn't change their mind. They refused to repent the fullness of iniquity. And that's what's going to happen at the end. So, verse 3. Um, Gail, could you read verse 3 of Revelation 20? Can you unmute, please? Not the dragon, what God, Jesus did. Three, what, what, verse three and where? Revelation 20, verse three. Oh, okay. 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 Verse three and 20. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be free for a short time. So it's interesting here. He locked him. He threw him into the abyss and he has that key. And what did he do? He locked it and sealed it over him. There's no way getting out. He is locked and sealed. They cannot deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. Now, after that, he must be set free for a short time. That is the hour of trial. We'll talk about that a little bit more. We allude to it again in chapter verse 7 when we get there. So, when does the thousand years begin? Cross. And when does it end? Coming or judgment. Right at the end. We're going to see that in Revelation 10, 7. But before I get there, I jumped ahead of myself. I want to talk about what does it mean that Satan's bound for a thousand years? Because I know what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have to. I've thought it myself. That's why I know what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Then why do we see much bad and evil happening all around us anymore? Why do we see it? Why do we see it? Oh, can't see any difference. I'm sure glad you asked. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it because the fact is, as far as deceiving the nations, we are not deceived. Though there are those who are deceived. If everyone was deceived, that would be a different thing. But not everyone is. Because salvation has been accomplished, you're yes. right. Salvation is now accomplished. There's no more deception. People have shut their eyes. You cannot deceive. You, you don't. There's. It says in the past he winked at them in the Old Testament. In a sense, 
salvation has not yet been accomplished, but now the cross has come. And they've even tried to change the calendar where it doesn't say BC before Christ and in the year AD in the year of our Lord, because they don't want to admit that the cross is the center of all history. It's before the cross and since the cross. That's the history of the world. <laughs> but they don't want to admit it. The center of all history is the cross of this world's, world's history. Begin at creation, it ends at the coming. And in the, right in the middle is salvation. Not saying it's in the middle of time, but the central thing that happened in history, the central pivotal point of history is the cross. There is now no more re reason for being deceived because Jesus Christ has come. He proclaimed on the cross, it is finished. Salvation has been accomplished and done just as certainly as creation is done. Salvation is done. There's only one more time that God says it is done. Do you know what it is? Read it. We read about it in the seventh bowl of God's wrath when he comes and pours out what we're talking about here in that seventh bowl, the coming of the Lord. But there is a sense that there's there's a little, a little caveat here I'm going to show you. So let me just talk about this. In, uh, I'd like to assign a couple of verses here. Um, Patty, could you read 2 Peter 2, 4 and Lynn... Jude 6 and um, Revelation 12, 7 to 9, Tim. In fact, I think I'm going to start with you, Tim, and have you read Revelation 12, 7 to 9, and then we're going to come back to Patty and Lynn. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Now, remember this, the context of this in Revelation 12 was when we talked about the, the man child born of the woman remember and then there's the dragon trying to destroy jesus when he was born and then he snatched up to heaven that was the cross and going to heaven ruling and reigning and so read this for us here seven through nine seven through nine and there was war in heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and the dragon lost the battle and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. And it says the ancient serpent called the devil and the whole angel. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Who, who leads the whole world astray? It said, I missed that part in here. I don't know what to do. It's different. He leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Remember before that, he was up in heaven. He could accuse, but the accuser of the brethren is cast down. The one deceiving the whole world. Deceiving the whole world. Okay, thank you. Was thrown down to the earth with his angels. Notice that's happened at the cross. He was bound then. Okay. So, um, second, uh, second Peter 2, 4. What does it say there? It says, um, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Yes, and it's going on to compare some things here, but it's talking about God did not spare the angels when they sinned, sent them to hell, it says here. It's interesting, that's the only place, the only place in the Bible, that this word is used for hell, translated hell. The word is Tartaru. And Tartaru was a myth, lot mythology, Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. In Greek mythology, it Tartaru was a subterranean abyss. Hmm, does that sound kind of like what we're reading about in Revelation 20? Sent them into the abyss. It says, did not the spare the angels, but sent them to hell. <laughs> Held them captive, sent them to hell. Sent them to this abyss. Isn't that kind of interesting to you? Putting them into gloomy dungeons. Notice, 
These angels are in the gloomy dungeon, just like the devil is. Sounds kind of similar to me. So people in the, in that day, because the Greeks had been ruling for so long, had been there so you know before the Romans had, and a lot of people spoke Greek. They were familiar with what that word meant, and that was a place where the, that subterranean place that you're down in this abyss. Okay, uh, what does it say in Jude six? And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he has kept in dark, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Does that sound kind of like what we just read in Revelation 20? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. So the dragon was bound, thrown into the abyss. I'm going to give you the answer. I didn't realize it was not yet coming. I just had to get these other verses thrown in. Locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore. Now, it's very interesting. It's because there's still some time to repent as well. In the fifth trumpet, I think kind of the answer of how he could not deceive the nations and why we still see him around, okay? And it, things happening, they're evil in the world because he hasn't been destroyed yet. Is at the answer in that fifth trumpet, remember there was three woes in the trumpets, the first one being the fifth trumpet. That fifth trumpet was the first woe. And drag, the dragon, the angel, is the king over the abyss. We, he's called Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer, the king over what happens in the fifth trumpet. The angel that had been cast down from heaven was given a key. That angel was cast out of heaven. He'd fallen, fallen from heaven. So that happens to be who? The trumpet. Oh, the trumpet. Satan. Uh -huh. The trumpet. Satan. The destroyer given a key and he opens a shaft to the abyss this is in Revela in revelation if you want to look at it revelation 9 but anyway what we see he opens the shaft of the abyss notice he can't open the abyss but he is allowed to open a shaft in the abyss i looked up what does the word a shaft in the abyss say well a shaft is a hole dug in the ground for a pit or a dungeon or something like that Mm -hmm. It's basically a hole. He's He can open a little hole in the abyss. And what came out of that hole? A bunch of dark, billowing smoke came out of this furnace abyss place. And it darkened the sun and the moon, you mean, the sun and the sky, didn't it? Smoke bills like a gigantic fur, a furnace, darkened the sun and the sky. What do we see come out of that smoke? Locusts come out of the smoke. What do locusts do? They destroy things everywhere they go. You can see why the king over this, this locust is the destroyer, the king over the abyss. They torment them. They're like scorpions. They look like horses prepared for battle. But they could not kill. Only torment for five months. Five is a month of grace. Month is five months is grace. The cup of iniquity was not full yet. And so we see there's five months and it mentions it twice. This time of grace where the gospel's going forth so people don't have to be deceived because the salvation has been accomplished. Satan's power is broken in deception. Does this make sense to everyone? Does it make sense? Do you see now why, while he's bound, there's a shaft that's still allowed to be open where you can see some of that his happenings, but he cannot see them. He cannot kill them. The cup of iniquity was not full yet. Okay, we better be moving along. We might do this in two, two days. Looks like we might. I don't know. We'll see. Two sessions. Okay. It says... Everything clear so far on those first three verses of <laughs> Revelation 20. Okay, we better move on, Bib. Okay, we got you. Okay. Let's see. We're going to go back to Patty. Uh, Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5. And I'm going to sign a couple other things. Matthew 19, 28, Lynn. And 
and Ephesians 2, 4 to 6, Gail. And I'll have you do Colossians 3, 1 to 2, okay? Okay, Patty, we're moving right along with chapter, verses 4 and 5 of Revelation 20. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay. Very interesting. Now we're getting a picture of the saints. What's happening during these thousand years with the saints? It's, I love what God does. He gives us a little pictures here and there, all the way, even all these times, right here about the saints. Don't you just love this? We have an amazing God that's showing us what the saints are doing during this thousand years. Uh, so what do they have? Who has that authority? Who has been given authority to judge? Lynn. Matthew. We have. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's right. I want to show for the scripture, but yes, you're right. <laughs> the saints. Jesus, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's uh -huh. us. That's us. That's us. When he is seated on his glorious throne, and when is Jesus seated? When is Jesus seated on his glorious throne? At the resurrection? Absolutely. When he's ascended on high, it says, that, you know, in Ephesians when he went 9. To heaven. Yeah, when he went to heaven. And, you know, the fullness of it happened 40 days later as he so went up. What did he do? In Ephesians 1 tells us he sat down at the right hand of God. So there's no doubt about it. Jesus has already begun his reign. He reigns now and he reigns forever there's not a starting of his reign when he comes that is coming it's already started he already reigns that's clearly taught in scripture so the beginning of the thousand years is his death nail on the satan and his resurrection seated at the right hand of god because salvation is accomplished we've talked about this before because it's alluded to many times in revelation already we've talked about it in revelation 4 he was seated on the throne right then in revelation 4 so yes and we have that authority he's given us that authority we rule and we do anything we actually have authority because you know it's uh we carry out his authority on earth. Did you know that? We're his ambassadors of reconciliation. Guess who those ambassadors walk in? The authority of the kingdom they represent. <laughs> so who reigns with Christ a thousand years? Okay, Gail, Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. I just can't help but have you read it out of the Bible. <laughs> but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So guess what? When were we raised? In mm -hmm. Christ. When he's raised, we're um. raised. <laughs> we're raised in Christ and we're seated with him. Where is he seated? Heavenly. Place of honor at the right hand of God and we it's rule God. and reign. Yeah. Because here we rule and reign with Christ. How long? Forever. Forever. Yeah. It came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Who's reigning with Christ a thousand years? The saints. the saints. I love it. 
I'm going to hark back to that fifth seal mentions something though here. It goes on to say, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus, because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast of the same age and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. Who are these? The souls of those who have been beheaded. Beheading. Does that mean literally they were beheaded? Is that making the symbol be the symbol? Message cut off. Message. They don't receive the message. Remember John the Baptist? He testified of Jesus. He testified of Jesus. And who the king of Herod, that Roman king, what did he have him do? He didn't like his testimony, did he? And he had beheaded. Get rid of that testimony. We see those saints crying out under the altar. What are they saying in the fifth seal? How long? How long, O Lord, until you, holy and true, until you what? Avenge yeah. all the blood. Does the avenging of the blood happen? When judgment's poured out on the devil and all wickedness. That, and he says, wait a little longer. You want to read it to you? It's in, um, and he says, Until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. <clears throat> That's what you would have gotten the answer if I read it. <laughs> Until you judge the earth. <laughs> and then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Does this mean just those that are persecuted? Or is this a symbol of everything complete the witness and the testimony rejected as we talked about in revelation 10 and 11 yeah it would be that wouldn't it it's talking about the complete testimony of all the all the church in the thousand years from the cross to the coming during this time period until they've all been beheaded testimony is done and we see that happening then when those two witnesses are killed and lie in the street for three and a half days remember that in revelation 11 so you see how the whole book ties together you see i'm i'm trying to tie some of the things in revelation so you can see how there's a theme happening here and now this is the culmination of what we were talking about there that it was looking forward to was this so <clears throat> How do they come to life? They came to life. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's Colossians 3, 1 and 2. How do they come to life? Um, I think it's is that Gail's turn. I think I gave that to Gail, did I? No, no, I don't think so. Did you? Unless you added it on to the oh, feature. Tim. Oh, that's tens. I'm sorry. Okay. I should write beside us, but I can sign these two. Yes, okay. <laughs> Colossians. I should say, who has Colossians 3? <laughs> Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about things of heaven, not things of the earth, for you died. You think it's under three. So think about things of heaven, not just things of earth. Oh, yeah. oh, you can read verse three and four if you want to. For you died and this life to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. That's really wordy. <laughs> can I read it in mine? Sure. <laughs> Since then you have been raised with Christ. <laughs> that's past tense have been raised with christ set your minds on things above not where christ is seated at the right hand of god set your minds on things above not on earthly things for you died we died didn't we and so then we have a resurrection then if we died we have a resurrection don't we and your life is now hidden with christ in god we're resurrected and seated with him weren't we 
when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's a coming. <laughs> I love it. It's just a little summary right there in Colossians. Don't you just love it? Thank mm -hmm. you. We have crossed from death to life. We had that first death. So what is this? What's the first resurrection? They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. By the way, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Who are the rest of the dead? Lost. The world. Everybody that's, that never receives Christ, they're dead. They can be alive, but they're dead. They're dead yeah. in the trespasses and the, sin. Yeah. The disobedient, yeah. Disobedient, yeah. So they don't, they're not going to be resurrected until the, they're not going to be there. They're not raised until then. So what's the first resurrection? This is the first resurrection. The new birth. Yes, it's the new birth. The first resurrection is the new birth. Don't you just love it? It's so clear here. I never realized that. Doesn't that make sense? It's biblically, it says. It says you've been raised. You're in the first resurrection. You died, now you rose. <laughs> Yay. I was dead, now I'm alive. I've crossed from death to life. Okay. And so we know the rest of the dead are those dead in their trespasses and sins. We don't have to read that. It's Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, if you want to look at it later. Now there's a wonderful promise. This is the sixth blessing in the book of Revelation. There's two more to go. We'll get them in the next study. <laughs> There's a seventh and an eighth. There's eight blessings and eight promises in the book of Revelation. Promises to overcomers specifically. There's other promises that promises to overcomers in the book of Revelation. So um, it's in Revelation 20, verse six. And that would be Patty's turn. Could you please read that for us? This is the promise. There's a promise in the sixth blessing in Revelation. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. There you go. Interesting, isn't it? I just love this. Blessed and holy. How are we holy? How are we holy? Christ. yes we remember he is our life he said that in colossians we are we washed our robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb that's the only way bev's holy or any of us it's not one speck of my holiness that counts it's jesus christ the lamb he alone is worthy i praise his name we have crossed from death to life. And the promise is, what is that promise stuck in that blessing? Second death has no power over mm -hmm. that person. I like how it said in your translation there, Patty, blessed is he, because it's an individual choice. That's it. When it talks about the overcomer, it's he. If anyone hears, let him hear. It's an individual choice. No one can make a decision for another. That's why in the that fifth trumpet, they could not kill you. It had to be, it's your decision whether you're going to be in the death camp or the life camp, the coming of the Lord. It's an individual choice. No matter what your parents think, your kids think, your husband thinks, your wife thinks, your child, your grandchild, your aunt, your uncle, mother, father. It's our choice. First Peter 2, 9 to 12. I'm going to assign that to you, Lynn. And then um, we get to the hour of trial, which will be um, Gail, Revelation 20, 7 to 8. We'll get you in just a minute. So there it is. And it, interesting enough, remember that second promise of the overcomer in that second church. It said that he will not be hurt at all by the second death. So it's already been alluded to. Now it's repeating it here the same thing right here mm -hmm. tying it together to the church right here so <clears throat> why are the saints you can answer this before we get to the answer in the bible why are the saints called priests of god and of christ oh 
excuse me, forgot before I get to that. Why is the second when is the second death again? Second death that has no power over us? That's judgment, the judgment. Permanent eternal death. Yeah. yeah. We'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. That's right. I just want to be sure we got the, it's interesting, second death, dead people die eternal death. Righteous people cross from death to life and partake in the first resurrection, and they'll be resurrected at the coming of the Lord and be with Christ forever, forever alive. Isn't that kind of interesting how they talk about first death, resurrection, and second death? Because you're born again from the dead. Uh huh. We're out of the dead. We've been mm -hmm. resurrected out of it. If you stay in it, you're going to be served to see the mm -hmm. eternal death. So it's just kind of these symbols well, are so. God's judgment wrath remains upon you if you stay. In yes, it. yes. Otherwise, it's a you're word. condemned already. Yeah, that's good, Tim. So, why are the saints called priests of God and of Christ? Amen. In Revelation one six, it says Jesus Christ had has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve His God and Father. Now, when do you need a priest? When do you need a priest? Weddings, funerals. <laughs> <laughs> forgive me. Love, if you're catholic forgive us your sins <laughs> why are we called a kingdom and a and priest <laughs> why are we priests <laughs> is that another way of saying ambassadors or representatives <laughs> well let's see what second first peter 2 9 to 12 says and just see <laughs> what we can tie, get a clear answer here okay good, good guesses 9 to 12 okay but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sin sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You know what that means? That last little sentence? If they're going to glorify God, I find in Revelation that the wicked curse God on that day. If they're glorifying God on that day, guess what they've done? Those pagans that had accused them and now they've seen their good works. And seeing what they really are. Do you think that could mean that those pagans had come to Christ? It's because well, they were the priests. They won't give glor they won't glorify. The only way they can glorify God mm -hmm. on that day that he visits us is they have decided, my gods are not gods at all. It's your God. You see, I believe the priestly ministry is to minister the, the our priest, our high priest to those around us. Mm -hmm. To minister the gospel, to be the ambassadors, like you mentioned, the ambassadors of reconciliation. If God is in us, then He visits us all, visits us all the time. Yes, but when it talks about the glorify God on the day He visits us, I think it's referring to that day, day of the Lord, you, the day of the Lord. There's okay. something about that day, the day okay. He visits us, because when He comes, it's it, it seems to me. I mean, see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. He hasn't really visited us in that sense until the coming of the Lord. But that's a thought. Appreciate everybody sharing. So, so when did the saints reign a thousand years? In the cross. To the coming. Cross to the coming, yep. Cross to the coming. <laughs> then we retire. Well, you don't need a, you don't need priests when you're all glorified. The point that we're glorified, there's no more corruption. This corruption puts on incorruption. This mortal puts on immortality. God keeps reigning. We keep worshiping. We keep worshiping, and He reigns forever. His reign never stops. Really, it begins at the cross and goes forever. Mm -hmm. But when you see it in the context of this earth, <laughs> for us, we're with Him. So. Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay, let's move on into the hour of trial. Revelation 27 to 8. 
you just flanked out your voice cut out. What revelation? Revelation on? verses 20, verses 7 and 8, I believe. Okay. I I, yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in, our, in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they're like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves, but fire came down from heaven and he devoured them. Oh, I went one. Too that's many. Good. <laughs> no, that's, well, that's fine. Oh, yeah, well, 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 that's fine. We'll just stop. We'll go ahead and talk about this. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. Notice, after that, he must be set free for a short time. Verse 3. This is talking about that, right? To play his last round. He's putting his last card cards on the table here he's released from his prison and what does he do he goes to see the nations in the four corners of the earth in other words the whole world everywhere where did we talk about this do you remember it he's gathering men together for battle and Gog and Magog, there's a bunch in the Old Testament about Gog and Magog. I don't think we talked about that before. And I don't think I have it in this lesson. It's some things in Ezekiel. And I didn't put it in this lesson. So. Um, there was a King Gog from the land of Magog. There's remember, a King Gog and the, the land is Magog. Mm -hmm. And it's a very wicked land in the north. Now the north is where the king, the wicked, wicked king in Daniel. It was the north fighting the south in chapters 10 and 11 in Daniel. And that northernmost king was a very wicked king. And the one in the south, they kind of sit together at the same table for a while. And then they get against each other. And there's always this fighting going back and forth. Some resistance starting to happen between this king in the north and this one in the south. And basically what happens is at the end, they're all united. They're sitting together agreement and that king that had been fighting it earlier talked in daniel's being the little horn which is satan because he has no power compared to god just remember that he's called the little horn <laughs> so if you think he's all powerful he's not he's judged he is hit he'll have be totally destroyed and no one can help him there's a whole bunch of this about this in Daniel. Several times there alludes to this. So he's gathering together for battle. And we saw this over here in the Armageddon, you know, in chapter 16, that sixth bowl of God's wrath, where the river Euphrates is dried up, remember, preparing the way for the kings from the east, the father and the son to come. Drawing up that river Euphrates, which feeds Babylon that's a life-giving force to Babylon. Could it be? We talked about that before. But it's kind of that drying up of the kings of the world. The whole worldly system starts crumbling, starts not working anymore, starts just, just crumbling. There's just badness and evil and not good things, not prosperity under their rule. And we saw clearly that in the 17th chapter, which is the next chapter after chapter 16, <laughs> where it's the pouring out of God's wrath and the sixth and the seventh bowl of God's wrath, and that it is done, then we see that hour of trial coming back to explain more about that battle of Armageddon. And what did we see there in chapter 17? We saw that beast that comes up out of the abyss. Who is that? It's the dragon. Remember, we talked about that. Review that our wow, Revelation 17 comes up out of the abyss and he comes up at that time when the seven kings are ruling. Right now, the six kings ruling, but there's a time the seven king, the seventh king will rule. That's the final kingdom of the world. 
That's a, during the hour of trial. And he's an eighth king. This, this beast that comes up out of the abyss is an eighth king. And there's new beginnings. Eight means new beginnings. But he's coming up in a new beginning, all right. He's coming up to what? His destruction. In other words, it's his end. He has a new beginning. It's an end. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He's an eighth king. He belongs to the seven. And you see then that seventh king, it kind of morphs out. And we see a little bit more of the telescoping out in Revelation 17. We see that seventh king, that the eighth king belongs to the hint, that group. We see it as 10 kings. Final test. We see them described. Some more detail going on in chapter 17 of Revelation. You're getting a little review here. A lot of the book of Revelation, aren't you? <laughs> kind of tying some things together here. And in Revelation 17, those 10 kings are the last stand at that hour of trial. And they make a decision that they are going to go and fight against what? Who are they fighting against? One great and mighty king. And what is he called? The Lamb. That is his favorite that is his favorite symbol in the book of revelation he's called the lamb <clears throat> it said they resist for one hour the 10 horns you have are 10 kings who have not yet received the kingdoms revelation 17 12 so i'm reading but for who for one hour the hour of trial will we will receive authority as kings along with that beast we just talked about that came up out of the abyss satan for that short time they have one purpose and they will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb. But the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. Oh, I just love it. Anyway, I couldn't help but throw a little bit in here. You know, this Bible is so rich. Isn't God amazing? The amazing lamb they're trying to fight. There's this battle of Armageddon. It's not a physical, let's fight it with nuclear bombs. Mm -mm 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 -mm. God doesn't fight that way. No way. Our God just fights. He's a consuming fire is who he is. You have something you're going to say. I can see it, Lamb. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. I was just thinking. <laughs> it's good. Oh, good. Oh, I'm glad. I love it. I love thinking people are <laughs> study. Because <laughs> it takes a lot of thinking when we go through this book. <laughs> Some people aren't willing to tackle it because they think, but why shouldn't they? Three blessings in the book, three out of the 12 blessings. We have, I mean, the eight blessings, we haven't even gotten to the eighth, the, the, the next blessing about reading and understanding this book. There's another one coming. Anyway, oh, excuse me, got carried away. The army like the sand on the seashore. Remember that old dragon standing on the shore of the sea in Revelation 13, one? If it has an army like the sand of the seashore, what do you think it is? All the wicked all the kingdoms of the world unnumbered it's kind of like that it reminds me of that sixth trumpet remember that's the second woe and it's when the, the four angels that are right there at the river euphrates are let to, are allowed to let the let it rip see god has control of when this hour of trial comes and they were set for this very day, hour, this very hour, day, month, and year. I believe it says, I don't want to misquote it. Now, it emphasizes sand instead of stars as being numberless. Does that mean it's under your feet? Uh, oh, that's good. Under the feet. It's of this world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stars are from up there. <laughs> they, they're actually suns. You know, stars give out light. <laughs> Sand doesn't give any light. It's just as on this earth. <laughs> but God used both of those word pictures with Abraham. But now he's just focusing on the, the earthly. The earth. But we're from the earth. So we're going to be like the sand of the sea. But we're up there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't you just love it? I like 
that. Thank you for bringing that in. Because we've transitioned. Mm -hmm. We're there. We're now, God calls us stars. We shine like the stars. He tells us that in the Bible. You know, you're shining like a star. Come away with this today. You're shining like a star. If you're in Christ, that light of God is just shining out of you. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes it's kind of hard to see. But Lord, may it be more clearly shining yes. out of me. <laughs> I keep oh, praying that. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I got carried. Sorry. I got keep rolling here, Deb. Stay focused. Okay, we'll come back. Thank you, folks. You're so patient going along with this with me. I want to just read this here about those the sixth trumpet and the four angels who've been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Third of mankind. It's a killing operation now. All these people are making their decision at the very end. God will not pour down his judgment until everybody in the whole world has made their decision, either in their mind or in their hand, against him. And he has a but the full harvest has to be sealed. Mm -hmm. So you have a full commitment to Christ or commitment to the devil. It's one of the two, only two camps. I believe at the coming of the Lord that the hour of trial is that final thing that separates the wheat and the tares of who or who. It's a final test to test the whole world, as Jesus has said to the Church of Philadelphia. But thank God. We have a mighty victor. Let's stay focused on Jesus. Oh, I need to talk a little bit more. And there was no repentance, by the way. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent. Mm -hmm. It means those people. They did not repent of their mm -hmm. works. You can see it all listed there if you want to read it in chapter Revelation 9, 20 and 21. There's, it, it describes what I see in our, well, sadly, what I see across our nation today. And no repentance. Just blatantly not saying, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Justifying why they did that. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. A hardening has taken place. I've seen it in our own nation. It happened in Egypt. It happened in Sodom. It happened in Noah's day. A hardening. A hardening. Okay. <clears throat> Where? The Battle of Armageddon. Oh, who's reading next? We read last. I did, didn't I? I've been reading all these texts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> who, who, who would like to? Well, Gail before you, I think. Who would like to read the next text? Second, Second Thessalonians, two one to four, and then eight. Is it Patty or Lynn that's next in line? Oh, Patty, go. Second Thessalonians, two one to four, and. I'll have you, Lynn, read verse 8 in a second. We should have her read this first because a lot of people have this one all messed up. And I want to just be sure we get this reiterated again right here because we're talking about this, our trial. I better keep rolling here. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4. Let's read about it. Lawlessness. This is the hour. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God on the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It's interesting. The son of perdition, I like that. That's a true translation of there. <clears throat> it does mean son, not a man. It means son of perdition. Is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. That son of lawlessness, he exalts himself everywhere. And notice where he exalts himself, finally, at the very end. Where is he exalting himself? 
Where is he exalted? God's, God's temple. Right in God's temple. What does that speak to you about this hour of trial? Where are we going to see this man of lawlessness? Is it going to be all outside the church? No, that's the church. It's going to be in the church. It's going to permeate the church and look like it's God. It's going to say, this is what you can do. It's going to be right inside the church as we know it. That's pretty scary to me when you think about that. <clears throat> so it goes on to say, let's go ahead and skip down to verse eight. You can go back and read the rest of it, but Lynn, go ahead and read that. Verse eight, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. So when, how does he destroy him? The breath of his mouth. Yeah. Destroy by the splendor. Overthrow with the breath of his mouth. And destroy by the splendor of splendor. his coming. Yep. Isn't that interesting? There, no evil can stand in the presence of a holy God. Mm -hmm. He is that holy. I've been going through the Lord's Prayer a lot, and I've been thinking about how mighty and holy God is. He is so holy. Okay. <clears throat> I think we got this. So let's move on. Revelation 20, verse 9. That would be for you, Gail. Oh, Revelation 20, what did you say? Verse 9. Verse 9. Okay. You read that already, and then go ahead and read verse 10. Read verse 9 and 10. You mean read both of them? Yeah, 20 verse 9 and 10. Okay. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever. Mm. And ever, yes. <clears throat> so and ever. <laughs> yeah. Notice Satan's army is outside the city that God loves. Does that remind you of anything like in Revelation 14 when the God has bring, brought in his harvest? His, his sickle goes forth and he gets his harvest. And then there's a one that's in charge of the fire. He calls to another one with another sickle. Get those grapes. Reap those grapes for the harvest of the earth. I mean, the harvest, you know, of the grapes are harvested and bring, and they go into, thrown into the wine press and trampled where? Outside the city and the blood flowed outside the city up to the horses' bridles. Remember those horses in Revelation when it talks about the six. The sixth uh, trumpet is the horses. Now you see the horses' bridles in Revelation 14. Totally. Judgment outside the city. Wicked are outside the camp. Righteous inside the camp. We see it here again. Same thing. It, it says that we are the city. Jerusalem. We are the city. Which would be Jerusalem. That's the city. He has. His, go his government is. With us. Really yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of analogous to the church in a sense yes here. it's analogous to the, the city is analogous to god's people there is you'll see that we'll get into that too some more there's something about the city that's us because mm. we comprise the city the city it's not so much about the city it's about the people you know what i'm saying it's about where god dwells and where we are that's true <clears throat> thanks for that point so what do we see here the devil thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown thrown and notice they've been thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur what is the huh? they're thrown alive in other words the beast and his image which is the king of this world and worshiping it are thrown alive in other words they were up to the coming of the lord they were still functioning out here still looking like it 
until the coming of the Lord. They're alive. But what do you see here? Why does it talk about the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet have been thrown and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever? What does that mean? Any thoughts? Long time. Complete. Forever and ever is the fullness of it happening. That's good. That's really good. It's interesting because there's several things it could be, but it means if something is burning forever and ever, can you ever reconstruct it? Nope. And we can't make burning forever and ever be the symbol. I mean, we can't make this symbol be the reality, right? Mm -hmm. If we if we say it burns forever and ever, that's reality. Then we've made the symbol the reality again, just like making the thousand years be a thousand years. You see what I'm saying? So we got to see what does this symbolize? And I think what you're saying there, it's an eternal destruction. It's eternally gone. It's done. Because you can never rebuild a city while it's on fire. You cannot, it will never be rebuilt. It will never be. Iniquity will not arise a second time, it says in scripture. Never again will this ever be, ever. Isn't that a neat promise? And I know one thing, if God said it, it's going to be like that. God said it, I don't doubt, but it will never, ever, 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 ever happen, ever again. If God said it, it's so. I love it. God is so clear on this. It was interesting, even in Revelation 14, it talked about, I said we talked about it, um, Yeah. And that, that Revelation 14, when it talks about the third angel followed them, saying, anyone worships the beast and the same age and so forth and so on, he'll be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day nor night for those who worship the beast in his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance of the saints, by the way, it says, <laughs> who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to him. You see, there's never any rest outside of Christ. Hebrews 3 and 4 talks about that. Those Sabbath keepers there in the wilderness, they didn't enter into the Sabbath rest. They kept the Sabbath. They couldn't pick up any man on that day. They, they could never enter his rest. They would never enter his rest. What did that Sabbath symbolize? Salvation. The rest of salvation. There's no rest day or night. They're tormented forever and ever. There's no rest outside of Christ. Anything outside of Christ, there's no rest. So I think it is a forever thing. It's a forever punishment, not punishing forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and tormenting forever and ever and ever and ever. You know where that thought came from? Socrates through Plato. And he brought it to the church. God had said the soul that sinneth it, it will die. And these pagan philosophers said their soul that will never, never die. That's what Socrates taught. There's some church people that say your soul won't die. You're going to live forever, either in heaven or hell. Hmm, you heard that said? I'm just telling you, it's not biblical. <laughs> Only Jesus saves your soul. Jesus said, don't fear that those who can cure your body and your soul. Fear him who can put both body and soul in hell. And that's right. the other word. Okay. So anyway, I had to throw that in for the understanding here what this means. Because I don't want to misinterpret a symbol and make the symbol be the reality. When we want to know what it's telling us here. It's saying he will never arise again. He's destroyed by the splendor of the coming of the Lord. Okay. By the way, just in case you need a couple of verses. Who's, who's next in line to read? Tim. Okay, Tim. Second Peter two six, Tim, and Patty, Second Peter three seven. 
and we will get to Revelation 20, verse 11 with you, Lynn. Okay. Second Peter 2, 6, just to let you know, there's, there's some other places in scripture that say this. Go ahead, Tim. Okay. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes and made them an example of what will happen to the ungodly people. Hmm. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Are they still burning today? Are they heaps of ashes? <laughs> Does it say there's smoke went up forever and ever somewhere about Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, there's an example. Yes. Yes. Okay. Second uh, Peter 3, 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the, the heavens and the earth reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction, it says in mine, I don't know what mm -hmm. perdition, it says destruction ungodly of ungodly men. Destroyed. And destruction of ungodly men. Another place that talks about Sodom and Gomorrah <laughs> burning forever. I don't have that in here, but here it talks about them being turned to ashes. So there's some parallelisms here. We see these things. I just wanted to show that biblically there's support. There's more than this that support what I was just sharing, just in case some of you might be wondering. Okay, Revelation 20, verse 11. We're moving into the judgment of the wicked. This is the last section, actually, of this study. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. Look here. Here's the judgment. Earth and sky fled from his presence. What does this sound like? The coming of the Lord. It's the coming. The end of the world, the earth and the sky flee. The seventh bowl, the final wrath poured out. And he's, God said, it is done. And every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. <laughs> that was in Revelation 16. So we see that this final judgment takes place at the coming of the Lord. And so I would like to have someone read Revelation 20, 12. And that would be Gail. And then okay. Tim read Hebrews 9 27 and 28 and I saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and books were opened another book was opened which is the book of life the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books so who are being judged here the dead and who are the dead the wicked. That's right. Those who wish they were. Yeah. This is talking about a judgment of the wicked. Old Testament, New Testament, all the wicked that have ever lived. They're the dead. Because they're judged by what? By their works. By their works. And any of us, if we're judged by our works, we're worthy of, we're condemned, aren't we? That's why we need a savior. Yeah. But that's another book. Don't notice there's another book. What was the other book? Another book was opened, which is what? The book of life. Mm -hmm. The righteous are judged by the book of life. The dead are judged by their books. I used to think this was a judgment of everybody. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I just didn't understand this very much at all. I'd read this and I was scared to death. I know my works wouldn't make it. And I thought that, you know, maybe if I was died before this judgment took place, that I'd be judged. And, you know. Or in some places there was the teaching that Christ died for your past sins, but yeah. it was between you and, and him the, now to get good enough to go to heaven. <laughs> That's what I used to believe. <laughs> yeah. I didn't believe that. <laughs> Can you believe I believe that? I can't believe I believe that. That's what I, that's what I believe too. And how do we get this misunderstanding? This should be an encouragement to Christians. 
This, this chapter should be one of great rejoicing for Christians. Right. I mean, thank God he deals with evil. <laughs> what if you, if there's a murder running loose, don't you want him to take care of him? Well, I do too. You know, it's so, it, this is so interesting because it, somehow we've twisted this to think that we're judged according to our works. And what it's truly saying is for wicked people, the works is all they're judged by. That's all they've got. They don't have an intercessor. They don't have the robe of righteousness covering them with the works of Christ, where your works are filthy rags. Your works are nothing because it's Christ righteousness that makes you worthy. And then you look at the dead and the wicked and all they have to be judged by is what they did. Same for um, when the Israelites, when the law was given to them, uh, it was said that let this be our righteousness. It was their works in obeying God. That was their righteousness. It's accountability. Yeah. Before salvation. Did you realize that the Israelites were baptized into Moses? You know, I kept thinking they're baptized into Christ, but it says in First Corinthians 10, is it? They were baptized, they were under the cloud and baptized into Moses. Into the law, to the... Into that law. Did mm -hmm. you know that law goes along with that priesthood? Covenant into that, that, that covenant, the old covenant? Moses was from the same family as Levi, from the Levi family, as was his brother Aaron, who's the priest. When there's a change in the priesthood, there's a change in the law. Mm -hmm. And that law, they ate the same spiritual food, which is manna from heaven. When Jesus came down in John 6 and he tells them that the manna was him, they had a fit. fit. And they sprang, same, drank from that same spiritual rock, which is Christ. They were baptized in Moses, but they really were supposed to be drinking from, eating from the man of Christ and drinking from the rock of Christ. And they were just seeing it, this old covenant, this physical land, this physical place. That we're this country under God. No, we're the chosen people. It was an old covenant. They would be judged by their works because that law condemns. It's a ministry of death. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Good news to the Christian. Because mm -hmm. yes. I'd hate to think I would be judged by what I did. Yeah, me too. Right? <laughs> all, all of us. <laughs> On a daily basis. <laughs> you know, uh, yes, that's why it. I couldn't help but throw Hebrews 9, 27, and 28 into the mix, Tim. <laughs> okay. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ died once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with sin, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. I like that, eagerly waiting for him. Notice, they're all assigned to die once, and after that, the judgment. Now we're seeing what the judgment is. The judgment is right talked about right here. Is it your books or it is the Lamb's book? It's a choice. But it, I love this. Christ was sacrificed how often? Once. He died that sinner's death. To take away the sins of many people. Why well, doesn't say all people? I had to point this out. Because even in the communion, he says, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. Why is it for many for the forgiveness of sins? Didn't he die for all? Mm -hmm. Why is the many that are forgiven? The ones who so, believe. They believe it. They receive they, it. They receive it. Yeah. All that receive it, he makes us the, gives us the right in John 1 to become sons born not in a natural way or because they decide to have a kid because they just did something to have them. But born of God to all that received him. He comes to his own, but to all that received him. 
to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear, it says again, this one says a second time. Not to bear sin. So the first time was the cross. The second time is the coming. You see how they're tied together? Satan's judged at the cross. He's doomed. The judgments fall. Ding. You're tossed out of heaven. You're bound. You still have a vent. You can let some steam out. And it gets some pretty bad venting coming, comes around. And at the end, you're going to let to see full force of what you really are so people can make that final decision, final test. But I'm telling you one thing. you got a time coming. I'm coming again. This time is not to, it's to bring salvation, not to bear sin. But his whole goal is to bear, bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. This is the goal of God. Oh, deliverance. Judgment falls every time in the Old Testament, every time judgment falls on the wicked. It's a time of deliverance for the saints every single time. Don't you love it? We serve That's an good. amazing Father. Awesome. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Patty, would you read Luke 10 20? Yeah. Luke 10 20. Luke 10, 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. His disciples have just come back from casting out all kinds of demons, seeing all kinds of things happening. They're rejoicing in the great, wonderful things they had done for the kingdom. And they had done some wonderful things. But Jesus gave them a little gentle rebuke here. Don't rejoice over all that. I mean, I'm glad you did it. I told you to do it. But there's one thing I want you to always remember. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the one thing to rejoice in. That your name is written in heaven. More important than any ministry, all the ministry I could ever do on this earth, is that I love Jesus and know him. It's not about my ministry. It's not about how, how popular I am or not. How many people I, I, I want to bring people to Jesus. Don't take me wrong. Oh, Lord, give me more. Lead me to the hungry. Mm -hmm. But, Lord, I want to know you most of all. So my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay. <clears throat> Revelation 20. Oh, oh, question of the wicked of the sixth seal. Who can stand? <laughs> The day, great day of your wrath has come on the sixth seal, which is about that covenant, opening up the covenant, that sixth seal. The great day of your wrath has come. And who can stand? Who? What is the answer? Who can stand when the judge, great day of the wrath of God has come? Of their wrath, the Father and the Son. And who? the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb has come. And who can stand? Some revelations. Yeah. Who can stand? The answer is in oh, Revelation please. 7, no. the 144,000. And you turn and he hears a number. And as in Revelation, you hear it and you look and what is this? It is a vast multitude without number. No one can count from every nation, tribe, kindred, and people, language, and people gathered around the throne wearing that white robe of Christ's righteousness, the redeemed, they can stand because they're in the Lamb's book of life. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Revelation 20. God has a full house, 12,000 from each tribe, 144,000. Full house. He's getting all his family. Not one is, not, is missing. They're all going to be there. This is inherent. We are in here. We are his inheritance. Yes, we are. Can you, what does that make you feel like? You're his inheritance. Pretty humble. <laughs> I sure does. This has been a lesson. I've just enjoyed this. Did you think this Revelation 20 would be this good? It's good. <laughs> it really is. Judgment against the wicked is a good is good news to the righteous. 
because it means salvation for the righteous when this happens. We can be face to face with Father. Okay, Revelation 20, 13 and 14. Uh, uh, Lynn. Oh, all righty. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And go ahead and read verse 15, I guess. We didn't get that included on here somehow. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So there we go. The sea gave up the dead, but we're in it. Sea is the kingdom of this world. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. It's just kind of reiterating what's happening here. Death, death and Hades gave them up. And every person was judged according to what he was done. He's talking about the wicked, all of the wicked here. Uh, there is a verse in Revelation 6, 7, and 8, Gail. Can you turn over there? This is the fourth seal. We're talking about death and Hades here. Remember, who has the key to death and Hades? Jesus. Revelation 1. Jesus Christ. We saw that in Revelation 1. And it, if we get to the fourth seal, remember the seals. The first four of the seals is kind of a description. We see the white on the right horse, white horse come riding out as conqueror. Well, that's Christ that has conquered hell and the grave. <laughs> because it's talking about the opening up of the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. We see the second one, the rider on the red horse with a large sword that divides, takes peace off the earth and divides things because it's a dividing point. The cross is the dividing point. We see the third one, which is that rider on the black horse with the scales in his hands. And it says, a measure of wheat for a day's wages and three measures of barley for a day's wages and touch not the oil and the wine. In other words, we've got a harvest here. The wheat, the whole harvest, the barley, three, life to the first, the first fruits. That's the first harvest. The full harvest is here. Judgment falls, but we got a harvest. That's the third force. That's what he's really after is this harvest. He's after this time of this harvest. Touch not the oil, the spirit, and the wine, the blood. Now we get the fourth one. This is the fourth horse. I'm just giving you the context we're reading right now. This is the overview. Remember the first four of the seals, trumpets, and bowls is the overview. Then you move into some more details in the fifth, sixth, and seventh one. Okay. So what is this one on the fourth horse? It is Revelation 6, verse 7 and 8. Is that me? That's you, Gail. Uh -huh. Okay. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, at, I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was falling close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. These are all the things we saw earlier of the destructing forces of evil. And now it's a fourth. The earth is destroyed. This describes this. There's a tie-in with this fourth force and the final judgment. For death and Hades and everything is dealt with. Of course, the seventh seal is the cross. Because that's how the whole new covenant was opened, was at the cross. But this is the ending of the covenant. No longer, we see it here, the harvest, and we see this that we're talking about today. Jesus holds the key of death and Hades. Death and Hades. Death and Hades itself. Death and the grave. And I, Tim, you're going to read the next text. We're thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, which is that eternal death. 
notice death and the grave are also thrown in the wicked satan the kingdom of this world the kingdom of darkness everything thrown into that eternal death would you please read first corinthians 15 20 to 26 tim in closing and i'm going to read one more after that and we're done any comments so far before we get this final text two texts because we're just about to stop in this study do you have any questions has everything been clear any other comments you'd like to make it's the first time it's ever dawned on me that the first resurrection is not a time in which I'm looking forward to. Yeah. No, the whole just... concept just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. It's just hard to believe that the first resurrection is here and now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of came together for me too for the first time. It's a whole all. new thought. Yeah, it has to be the new birth. It has to be because we see it everywhere else in scripture. It supports it. Isn't it that it's like, how did we miss that? How did I miss it all these years? Yeah. It makes total sense. Uh -huh. I love the contrast between the first resurrection and the second death. Yeah. There's just such an interesting concept contrast here. Because the first resurrection, you've been born into eternal life now. We just haven't seen the fullness of it yet. Because we're not face to face yet. But when he comes in that glorious day of his appearing, we've already, cro already crossed from death to life. Uh -huh. What assurance we should have as we walk through our day. What a mighty son of God we serve. Jesus Christ. Okay. I couldn't help but read have 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 26 in conclusion and study. Well, the next to last conclusion. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> this really should be it, but. I'm going to tie it into something in the Old Testament. Okay. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 26, it's a very good passage. Uh, what just, yeah, 20 to 26. Mm -hmm. Talking about the resurrection, the literal resurrection from the dead that's going to happen down the road. Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is a, an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come when he, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. There you go. Don't you just love yes, this? Yes, oh. yes, yes. <laughs> awesome. Oh, he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed destroyed all dominion authority and power for he must reign he's reigning right now you know <laughs> he's not waiting for him to reign he is reigning folks until he has put he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet he's gonna crush the serpent well, they're all there now. They just don't all know it yet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Mm -hmm. I feel like singing the doxology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe we'll end up singing the doxology when we end, right? That's going to be our final prayer when we get done. But in the end, turn over to Daniel 12. I just love Daniel. I've learned to love this book. If you need to go, you can go. Thanks for coming. This is this is the last verse. 
at the and it's Daniel 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince. Who's Michael, the great prince? The archangel of God? Jesus. Jesus Christ. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book <laughs> will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. And then skipping down to verse 13 of that last verse in Daniel. As for you, go your way till the end. That's the coming. You will rest. And then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. What a grand day that is going to be. Allotted. Here's a set aside for you. Set aside for you. Oh, what good news this is today. All right, let's just sing the doxology in, in conclusion today. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God him from whom here below. Praise him above me, heaven and Praise Father, Son, and Holy Amen. Well, Lord, we just praise you. Hallelujah. Glory. I know when it's on Zoom, it kind of has echo in this doxology. We're all raising our doxology of praise to you. Sorry. You are the glorious and mighty one. You are the worthy lamb. Thank you, Lord. We've been raised in Christ and seated in your heavenly places. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Father, we look forward to that day of your appearing. Keep us faithful to the end, and you will give us that crown of life. We rejoice in our salvation. And may there be blessings on each one here today and those who are listening at later times that the power and the anointing of the Spirit of the living God will just flow into our lives. We stay strong in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Mm -hmm.